a serial killer who eluded justice for decades as he was in and out of prison since the 70s. With his recent arrest and chilling admission of more murders, the investigation takes a new turn, reopening cold cases that could hold the key to uncovering the full extent of his gruesome crimes. Join us as we dig deep into the past, present, and future of this haunting case, shedding light on the failures of the justice system that has left the families of the victims suffering. Here's a serial killer that, that uh, justice was not served. So there's a travesty of justice uh, totally in this case. We unravel the disturbing details of a murderer who repeatedly slipped through the cracks of the justice system. This is Texas Crime Stories, the Austin Caller, unveiling of a serial killer. On May 20th, a welfare check call came in to Pflugerville Police, which is just north of Austin. The family of 80-year-old Jesse Fraga had not heard from him in over a week, and they were concerned. When police went to the former probation officer's home inside, they found a horrific discovery. Fraga was found with a belt around his neck, a severed spine, and a puncture wound to his neck. A murder investigation began and the hunt was now on from whoever killed Fraga and police first wanted to find his roommate at the time, Raul Mesa Jr. Photos of Mesa were released to the media as a person of interest and police didn't have to wait long to get a break. Days later, the tip hotline gets an unexpected call from Mesa himself. Austin Police Detective Patrick Reed was the person who spoke with Mesa. On May 24th, uh, I answered the homicide mainline and the caller stated my name is Raul Meza and you're looking for me. Mr. Meza said he was ready and prepared to kill again and he was looking forward to it. In that phone call Meza would also not only confess to Fraga's murder but to other murders he alleged to have committed. But before police could get his location Meza hung up. A fugitive task force was put together and on Memorial Day in North Austin Meza was found riding a bike carrying a bag with zip ties, a flashlight, a gun, and multiple rounds inside. Now behind bars, investigators are now tasked in finding out just how many people Mesa may have killed. Austin Police Detective Katie Connor says it's a number that could right grow. Now we have between eight and ten cases that kind of fit the similar circumstances that we're looking at. News, weather, mental health, true crime, and all things San Antonio. KSAT has a podcast for everyone with a local twist. Tune in daily for the day's top stories on KSAT News Now. Or learn more about South Texas weather phenomena with whatever the weather. Deep dive into mystery with true Texas crime stories that happen right here in our own backyard. And count on the KSAT Explains team to answer some big questions about San Antonio. Plus, our newest edition, Living Out Loud, making mental health health easier to tackle in San Antonio. Find us anywhere that you get your podcast. Be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. Or watch the video versions on our KSAT YouTube page. Remember to subscribe there too. Raul Mesa Jr. for years led a life of crime. In 1975, at 15 years old, he was arrested for robbing and shooting a convenience store clerk. He served five years and was released on parole. When he got out of prison for that crime, he soon struck again. In 1982, an eight-year-old Kendra Page was raped and murdered. Her body found in a dumpster at Langford Elementary School in southeast Austin. Mesa at the time was still on parole for the convenience store shooting. Mesa was arrested right after the murder, but to the surprise of many, pled guilty and took a plea deal and was sentenced to only 30 years in prison. But it just gets worse. In 1993, after serving only 11 years, Mesa was released on parole. After Mesa was paroled, he was in and out of prison several other times. According to KTBC in Austin, in 1994, Mesa was arrested on a parole violation and would spend the next 20 years on and off of parole. During that time, he claims to have committed other murders. Here's Detective Reed with more about what Mesa told him. Quote, I got out in 2016. I end up murdering a lady soon afterwards. It was on Sarah Drive. That lady was 66-year-old Gloria Lofton, who was found dead in her East Austin home in 2019. It appeared she had been sexually assaulted and strangled. 
Male DNA was found on Lofton and tested. Almost a year later, a DNA match was obtained, and according to police documents, that match was Raul Mesa. But nothing was ever done to arrest Mesa after that match was made, and he remained out of jail. Austin now had a serial killer to deal with, a man that should have never been released from prison, but the Texas justice system failed. So Lee, this, this whole kind of story just kind of came out of the blue this spring, and it's just kind of evolved from there. There's just so much to unpack with this one. Oh, absolutely. And just trying to detail the different failures that happened, that's part of what allowed this guy to keep committing these kinds of crimes. It wasn't just a failure of the justice system, but it's also a failure on the part of police when they identify that DNA. Why would you not arrest this person right away? And there's actually an investigation going on into that right now. But when Mesa was paroled in 1993, something I found really interesting at the time Nobody wanted him in their town. We don't want him in our neighborhood. I think it was the city of Mineral Wells that had this whole like to do and made sure that he wasn't allowed there when he got out. And he was run out of several towns um, because residents rightfully feared for their safety. Yeah, I wouldn't want this guy as my neighbor, especially if he's showing he has no regard for other people. He's going to continue to do these crimes. Yeah, and it was obviously what we saw. Of course, nobody knew that then. The Associated Press actually reported that Mesa also lived in El Paso, Wichita Falls. We mentioned Mineral Wells, Sweetwater, and Uvalde County. And he was, like I said, run out due to community protest. And it's really interesting to think that these cities were actually right. These residents were rightfully afraid and look what happened. He ended up in other places committing murders, which was in the Austin area. Absolutely. And the AP also reported that after he moved to Uvalde County to live with his grandparents, he was jailed again because his family says that he was verbally abusive to them. So he doesn't care about his own family. Why would he care about a stranger? Like we said, there's a lot to unpack with this with this guy because it's just such a long history. He committed his first crime at 15 in the 70s, and then we saw it just evolve from there. A review is being conducted about the investigation into Lofton's murder as nothing was done when there was a DNA match. You kind of mentioned that just a little bit earlier. How did Mesa know Lofton? There was really no kind of clear sense. Some people, I think, claimed that he lived down the street from her, um, was an acquaintance. Apparently, Gloria Lofton was a very friendly person, always trying to help out others, especially those who needed a place to stay or, you know, just needed some help with something. And he obviously took advantage of that because I think some uh, money was actually stole from her home as well. It's very justified that an investigation is happening into her murder and then also into the handling of how that murder was, was solved. Because if you waited all this time to catch this person, when you know their DNA is on this dead woman's body, why would you not jump into that? I think also that was really interesting to me, and I didn't really put it here in our notes, was that her death wasn't ruled a homicide until he confessed to it this year. So it was always kind of unknown on how she died. And when he called police and confessed to her murder and others, they went back to the Emmy and were like, hey, we got these details. They were like, oh, yeah, we can rule it strangulation homicide now. Like, it was just there's so many the, like missteps that were constantly done in this case. And... What if they would have caught him in 2017? Yeah, it took a year to get that DNA match, but you knew since 2017. And still, it was still not even ruled a homicide at that point. Right. And we, as much as he wants to be open and honest now and confess to certain things, we also don't know really what he did during that time period. This is a dangerous person who is out on the streets potentially terrorizing people. Yeah, and I thought it was really interesting, and that's why I kind of wanted to bring in Dr. John Delatore, who's Shout our, out John. <laughs> our forensic pathologist we kind of reach out to about this cases, and he's he's done some cases with serial killers involved, and I thought it was really interesting to get his insight because I felt like Mesa wasn't a typical serial killer with a pattern that we see, and here is what Dr. Delatore said about Mesa. My first impression was that it was complicated. He's a very curious individual in his victim selection, that's for sure. So when we think about when someone is going to commit acts like this, they typically have a typology. 
Now, it doesn't mean that someone has, that every victim has to have like the same hair color or the same skin. It doesn't necessarily mean that, but it it's usually confined to a specific set of characteristics that, that each victim shares. And I'm not entirely sure what each of these victims share other than being in his like sphere, right? That they were just kind of around him. Some knew him, some didn't. Uh, it, it, it's, 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 it's very difficult to kind of pinpoint why he's engaging in these behaviors because the victimology doesn't suggest anything in particular. Yeah, it's definitely not something that we've seen in a while. In a while. Exactly what you said. I mean, he doesn't even see, like he said, the typology. He doesn't see a method to the madness with this. He's just speculating and trying to figure out how do you jump in this guy's mind when it seems like it was so random and how he killed people. Yeah, if you look back to the to even the 80s, I mean, he killed an eight-year-old little girl brutally killing her and leaving her body. Um, I thought it was really interesting his input because I think is this is something police haven't seen before and he also made it a really good point to say that because of the failures this is why it escalated and here's a little more of what he kind of had to say about that and what he feels like if this was nowadays he wouldn't have been able to do what he's been doing. It's definitely something that technology had these things started nowadays, right? Had, you know, the killing of the child and stuff. Had it started now, I think this guy probably would have been in prison for a lot longer than he had been. And I don't know that he would have had the opportunity to engage in the, the future crimes that he did. But really, this is about how difficult it can be to engage in an investigative process and really bring to justice someone when all the evidence could easily be washed away over time. So going back to that, that Kendra Page case from the 80s, Austin PD held this press conference. The current interim assistant city manager in Austin, Bruce Mills, he was actually the detective on the Page case back in the 80s. And he was really upset. Like you could see he was really upset about how this case has just, it's still an issue. And he spoke during that press conference and here was his thoughts. Uh, talked to the media at the time about the, the travesty of justice even then uh, when he'd only done 11 years from a 30-year uh, sentence and then here we are 20 years after that, 30 years after that, 93 to now uh, and as we just said, suspect in, in other cases, cold cases. Um, so, you know, here's a guy that should have spent the rest of his life probably from the time he nearly killed a gentleman in, when he was 15 years old certified as an adult, later commits capital murder, pleads to murder, is released 11 years later, and is killed how many people we don't know. So here's a serial killer that, that uh, justice was not served. So it was a travesty of justice uh, totally in this case. So here's even a detective, Lee, that obviously was upset then when he got a plea deal. 30 years for the brutal murder of an, a child, 30 years is nothing because obviously he got out early in 11 years. Murder and rape of yeah, a child. Yeah, exactly. And got out, continued and continued and continued to mess up and was still able to get out. And he said it right. It is a travesty of justice. We said earlier that police are investigating somewhere between eight and 10 other cold cases that Mesa might have been linked to. And... Some of those could be right here in San Antonio. Yeah, this was a real twist for us here. I remember when we were watching that press conference when it was taking place in Austin. We were like, excuse me, what? He's been here? Yeah. So apparently in the phone call um, with Detective Reed, Mesa told him he had committed a double homicide here in San Antonio. Now, San Antonio police say they are investigating the claims. Here is the statement they sent to us. It says, our SAPD homicide detectives are in communication with Austin PD and currently looking into the statements made by the suspect. SAPD said APD is the lead agency in this case and no interviews will be provided. There is no additional detail. So we don't know when, who, where. We have no idea. Obviously, it's something we're still looking into and we'll continue to look into because I have a feeling we could find out soon. I mean, I hope we do, and I hope that whenever we do find out, again, this could bring closure to families who haven't known for 
who knows how long. Yeah, so I, I don't know. I wasn't able to get much other details on that San Antonio connection. But the fact alone that there was a San Antonio connection, he was specific with Detective Reed and telling him about that double homicide, I feel like what else is there that we're not being told or he is not saying? Absolutely. And there was actually a recent search that happened in Pflugerville in a field there. It's still obviously a very open investigation. Criminal defense attorney Ty Cardena said the FBI search of the Pflugerville field could be actually related to the Fraga murder because this field that they were searching was right next to that home. Cardenas was talking to CBS Austin. He told them, quote, it could be something that is connected to him that would also prove his guilt in addition to other evidence, something else that it could be. It could actually be a completely new crime that they're investigating. They could have gotten a tip, especially now that it's national news that he's a serial killer, unquote. So I feel like when it comes to serial killers, I mean, you can take their word with a grain of salt. Exactly. But you don't actually know the full extent because they're not going to obviously be honest with you. And we've seen so many times where they over say they over kind of overkill. I hate to use the word like that, but they say they've committed all these murders when in fact they're not related to them at all. It's just this kind of smug thing that they do to to stay relevant, you know? Yeah, they just want to up their body count, essentially, to have some kind of clout, which is disgusting. So, yes, this is obviously still a open case, one that is not close to being done, one that we're going to continue to follow. And hopefully we do get more answers from police soon, especially, like you said, to give closure to families of those cold cases that they may be looking into. Absolutely. Well, thanks so much for being with us for Texas Crime Stories. We'll be back soon with another episode. Hello, everybody. Stefania Jimenez here. Thank you so much for watching KSAT's YouTube channel. Keep up to date with all of San Antonio's top news, weather, and so much more by clicking the like and subscribe buttons below. And once again, thanks for watching KSAT.